Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardness of heart. They become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 to 24. Now we read these scriptures purposely because we're trying to show a contrast between Ephesians 4, and what we find in Romans 7, verses 13 down to 24. And we do so because we are concerned about the Christian church, the state of the church, those who profess Christ as Lord specifically in North America and Western Europe. Now, we're not judgmental or or censoriousness about it, but we're concerned because the church lacks power, lacks spiritual life. And we've given some evidence to back up our concern. In fact, I would even put this challenge to any evangelical uh, minister that too might disagree with me. I'd be happy to meet with them, and and I would suggest that we would meet for lunch after a month. And uh, we would sit down, and, and you would share your arguments with me and make your case. And what I would do then is I would play back sermons that you preached, assuming that they're available online, and I would play them back to you over the past a month or years of your ministry. That's what I would do because many times you hear ministers from the pulpit all the time lamenting over these concerns. You can hear it in pastor conferences. You can hear it in pastor Q&A sessions. So that's what I would do. Because I don't think I'm saying anything different than what I'm hearing from these men from my own personal pastors uh, throughout the years, as well as what I'm hearing from these conferences, and we've talked about surveys and all the rest. Now, so, in, in what we're pointing out here, and there might be a better set of scriptures to do it, is that Romans 7 to 13 to 24 s- describe to us, we don't believe it is Paul's personal experience. And the teaching of Romans from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, his 14 volumes, and you can find his sermons available on his trust site, which we highly commend to all, is that we stand with the doctor on the understanding of these scriptures. That, you know, whether the man is regenerate or unregenerate, it is a very difficult thing to say, right? Because you see an individual who's concerned about their sin. You see an individual who believes the law is good. You see an individual who's crying out. They don't necessarily know who to cry out to. And you could say, that's certainly a work of God. They're not comfortable in their sin. They want to do something about it. All right? So, so, so that is certainly, we can definitely say that person is alive. But at the same time, this individual believes that they're sold under sin. And that they can't do the things that they want to do and the things that they don't want to do. Uh, they continue to do and the reason they can't do the good that they want to do is because they have no ability to carry it out well what we can definitely say whether this person is a christian or not a christian this is definitely not the high point of a christian's life we can definitely say that i think we could all agree to that and we don't think apostle paul is describing a personal experience in these verses we think he's continuing on his argument that the christian is no longer under the law but under grace but if you put yourself under the law this is how you're going to behave and so our argument is this all right cuz see martin luther now this is not my interpretation of luther but on his work in in galatians he says quote he says i want the christian And this is the quote, to live as if there is no law. Now, why would he say that? Well, because I believe he's following Apostle uh, Paul's argument here in Romans that you're no longer under the law so that you could belong to someone else, that you and I as Christians are married to Christ. I believe it is the Puritan Thomas Manton, if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but in his works on Romans, he makes the point 
that you are not that Christians are not to live under the law any longer that you cannot be justified that you cannot be sanctified by the law of it uh, by itself in your own flesh so to speak right but Thomas Matton used this illustration that says such a Christian that falls into sin and then runs back to the law is somebody who like builds a dam and stirs up all the water and holds it all back and what are you doing you're just stirring up sin it's like running back to the law is like building a dam just to hold back all your sin and collecting all your sin and stirring it all up and then all the weight of it comes upon you and Thomas Matton is saying don't do that and Martin Luther is saying don't do that it's the wrong understanding of the law and not that not that the law is bad no no even the man in Romans 7 says hey the law is good the problem is us it's how we're responding to it. We're always wanting to justify ourselves by some meritorious works. We need to stop doing that. Now, the reason why I'm reading Ephesians 4 as an example, all right, is that our emphasis needs to be turning from running back to the law to justify ourselves or to somehow sanctify ourselves, like what the Pharisees were believing, what they were doing, they kept the law very well, didn't they? I understand the hypocrisy in it, but but the Pharisees were very moral people. But what it proves is that a sinner can be very comfortable in a dead religion, because that's what the Pharisees had, right? When you look at Pilgrim's Progress, for example, as soon as Christian comes to the cross and his burden is taken away, fallen into a ravine, never to be seen again. And he's given a new set of clothes, and I believe he's given a key, and he's given a document, likely to represent his assurance of salvation. And as soon as he leaves the cross, he can't wait to share this gospel message. And he comes across slothful and presumptuous and simple. And he wants, and he warns them, doesn't he? He says, hey, there's a roaring lion because these three individuals are along the narrow path. So you can assume that these are religious people, right? But so Christian warns them and says, hey, you got to care for your souls. There's a roaring lion that could come along and devour you and you're sleeping like you're on top of a mask on a, on a selling chip. And don't you see that there's a deep sea underneath you and if you fall off the mask and fall into the sea, all your sin's going to weigh you down. Wake up, sleeper, wake up. And Simple says, I see no danger. And Slothful says, let me rest a little bit longer. As if implying that if there is danger, it can be dealt with later. And Presumptuous says, hey, every tub has to hold its own weight. <laughs> every tub has to own its own weight. And when I read that, I was like going, oh my goodness, what does this mean? But I think what presumptuous is saying is, hey, every man's got to stand on his own. Mind your own business. And what's my point? That it is very possible for us to take comfort in a dead religion. And we shall not do that. The Christian must not do that. We know that a Christian perseveres by how well he or she is persevering. And as the Hebrew writer warns us, we shall not neglect this great salvation. What should become of us if we, if we neglect this great salvation, my friend? No, we have to care for our souls. So our basic argument is, we seem to be spending a lot of time, and again, maybe there's a better set of scriptures to show this difference, but we seem to be making the mistake of running back to the law Ignoring our marriage to Christ, okay, versus what I'm suggesting to you is that you and I need to focus on putting off the old self and putting on the new self. Now, Thomas Manton, in, in his works in John uh, 17, now he wrote, I believe, over 30 sermons on John 17, by the way. J just a, an amazing preacher. But in one of his sermons, he said, listen, when you approach Christ, okay, don't merely go to him and say, Lord, I need some of your compassion to get me through the misery of this life. All right? Thomas Manton goes on to say, that is to go to a mistaken Christ, 
to a forgotten Christ. It's as if Thomas Manton is saying that is misplaced priorities. Well, how should we go to Jesus? Well, what Manton says is we should go to Christ and say, Lord, make me holy. I want to belong to you. I want to belong to your country. I want to be with where you are at. I don't want to be a slave to sin anymore. I don't want to be a slave to the law. I don't want to be a slave to this world. I don't want to be under Satan's rule any longer. I want to be with you. I want to become holy. Now, you may be asking me at this point, you say, John, can you give me something a little bit practical on throwing off the old self and the new self, right? Because, you know, it does get frustrating, doesn't it, when we hear a lot of preaching that's exhortation, and that's what the scriptures do. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that. But it seems like we never get to where we want to be. Again, I go back to the Romans 7, because it's that one verse that says, you know, the good I want to do, I, I, I can't do, because I don't seem to have the ability to carry it out. And that, and that's what I read, and that's what I see, and that's what I observe, that as Christians, we don't seem to have the ability to, to carry it out. You know, I would, you know, there seems to be such an emphasis within the Christian church of of evangelizing, of trying to figure out how, how do we keep our churches alive and, and how do we reach lost people. But I don't even know, quite honestly, if we even have a gospel that is worth sharing. I mean, if if the lost world was to visit all of our churches this Sunday, would they see the power of God? Would they see people putting off the old self, putting on the new self? I mean, is there really that much of a difference between how Christians are living their lives versus how the unregenerate world is living? Now, at this point, you might be saying to me, John, my heart is with you. But can you offer me some practical spiritual advice, like a Christian prescription, so to speak, about how to throw off the old self and putting on the new self. Because I do think that I'm one of those Christians, and I'm right there with you, that seems to do spend so much time and energy living under the law and not under the grace of Christ. So is there some prescription, John, some spiritual advice? Well, let me do the best that I can. This is, this is what God's been impressing upon me. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good, right, and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, number one, you have to remember from the very beginning, I said that unless you and I become like children, meaning that we're teachable, that we can give up our lofty opinions and our biases and our prejudices. In other words, if we're going to come and um, come to the scriptures, trying to fit the scriptures within our paradigm, well, then it's a useless cause. It's a fruitless effort. All right, we have to approach the Bible and ask ourselves, what is God telling us, versus what are we trying to get out of the Bible, like meeting our felt needs. So we have to become like children. And if we are like children, then we'll understand what I'm about to say. For at one time you were in darkness, but you are now light in the Lord. That is a statement of fact. All right? He's not asking you how you feel. He's not asking whether you agree. This is the Holy Spirit utilizing uh, Paul as an instrument and stating a fact. All right? So there are facts. So, for example, what is it, Romans six fourteen, that uh, let sin no longer has dominion over you, but you're no, you're no longer under the law, but you're under grace. That's a fact. And earlier in Romans six, you and I as Christians are dead to sin. That's a fact that it no longer reigns in our lives. That we at one time we had when we were in darkness, as Apostle Paul is saying here, hey, sin had its foot on our neck. All right, but now that we're born again. Our foot is on sin's neck, 
It's beneath us. It's below us. It's no longer above us. We actually have power to confess our sins and to confront it and have victory over it. All right? Fact that we are no longer married to the law so we can belong to someone else. Fact. All right? And, and I was trying to show this because in in John 17, I was trying to make the point that, it's, that Christ knew more about his disciples knew more about what was true of themselves than they were able to recognize of themselves, all right? And I believe the same thing is true for Christians, that God knows more about us, about what's true of ourselves, than what we can even recognize at times, all right? So that's why we need to come to the scriptures based on what are facts, what is God saying to us, all right? I'm not suggesting our feelings are unimportant, but we have to start with, what is God saying versus what is us? So there is a fact. Now we have this exhortation, right? That this is true of us, so we walk as children of the light. And you say, all right, but John, but that's where I kind of get confused because I'm not really sure what to do. Well, here's the call to action. It's right here at the end, verse 10. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. There's your call to action. You want to put off the old self and put on the new self? Well, discern what is pleasing to the Lord. How do you make your decisions? The decisions you have to make today. I mean, you've probably made 100 decisions this week. Are they pleasing to the Lord? Do you know what's pleasing to the Lord? Do you know the mind of Christ as Paul teaches it in Philippians 2? Have you read Colossians chapter 3 starting with verse 22 about putting off the old self and the new self of gentleness and kindness and humility bearing with one another forgiving one another in sins so my call to action is to discern what is pleasing to the lord you and i need to stop looking at god as an abstract being god is a person a real person who has likes and dislikes, all right? And because we are married to him, we need to get to know him, don't we? And we do that by his word. In other words, you and I need to stop acting like Hindus. Hindus, you know, are, are, are maybe a better example would be new age, new age type of thinking, like spiritualists, where we're gonna sit around and we're gonna pray to God and we're waiting for some spiritual feeling, we're waiting for some devotional feeling. What I'm suggesting to you is, is is that's behaving more like a Hindu or New Age than it is a Christian. No, no. God has made himself known to us. We are not worshiping an unknown God, right, that Paul preaches in Athens in Acts. No, no, no. Our God is known. He has revealed himself to us through his Son and through his Word. And that's why the Bible needs to become precious to us, all right? So, yes, you and I have to spend time learning what is pleasing to God, all right? There is no easy, quick, magic pill that you can take for Christian usefulness. You and I have to have a desire to not know about God, but to know him. We have to remind ourselves back in John 17, what is eternal life? That you and I would know God. Well, what's pleasing to the Lord, John? Well, we find it in these brackets, don't we? At least in our Bible, what is good? what is right, and your translation might say righteousness, and what is true. Now, what is good? What, what is that referring to? Well, good, you know, goodness, beauty, loveliness, all right? That's what goodness, that's what goodness means. That, that's what's pleasing to the Lord. What about righteousness? Well, this is speaking to about morality. You have a, you have a, a plumb line, don't you, right, of making sure that we are right, and so what is God concerned about when he uses right or righteousness? It's to be right, meaning justice and fairness. So how good, how kind are we being to other individuals? To those, to all individuals that may cross our path every day? Are we pursuing beauty and loveliness in our lives? What about righteousness? Are we being just? Are we being fair? And the third one is true. You and I need to discriminate, but not discriminate in this godless, the way this godless world discriminates against what people because of race and sex and color and social status and 
and and and you know and and where you were born and all the rest of it no that is that is unchristian that is sin but the discrimination that i'm speaking about is you and i need to be able to discriminate between what is true and what is false right. let us then in light of this truth reject the ways of simple and slothful and presumptuous let us do the hard work by learning what is pleasing unto the lord and applying it by faith in our lives. Let us remember the words of the Hebrews writer in chapter 12, verse 14. It says, Pursue to be at peace with everyone, and holiness, for without it no one will see God. Let us recognize that we are more than conquerors, for we are in Christ. Let us humble ourselves like children, and realize that the Lord may know what is more true of us than what we can even recognize of ourselves at this very moment. In the upcoming weeks, to learn more about what it means to throw off the old self and put on the new self, we are going to go back 300 years so we can hear from brothers and sisters of the faith that have lived before us. Can you slow down enough to listen to those that have lived before you? I hope you can. Have you seen the picture this week? of the group of Christians that are meeting outside because they're commemorating a time when they were uh, they had no church to meet in. These are rebels. These are dissenters. These are nonconformists. These are the Calvinistic Methodists. And these Christians can help us learn what it means to be married to Christ, to live a spiritual life, a life of power, the life of the ability where we can forgive one another, where we can confess our sins, where we can hold on to sound doctrine, where we just don't know about God, but we know him, we experience him, where we can have not just simply salvation, but the assurance of salvation, where we turn our focus where we're not just justified, meaning, oh yes, we're justified by faith, so the penalty of sin has been done away with, but let us now turn our focus that we are sanctified. In other words, let us deal with the pollution of sin, let us not be ashamed to go to our Lord and say, Lord, make me holy. And these Calvinistic Methodists have much to say to us about these matters. And so if we're willing, we have much to learn. Well, let's bring it to an end for this week, shall we? Until next week, may Christ be your intimate companion. May Scripture become your new language. And may prayer become your new daily sport. Grace upon grace be with you. Thank you.